Father God, we just submit to your purpose and your presence here today. And we pray, dear God, that your will would be done. We pray, dear God, that you would speak through me, that I would say what you want me to say, that you would cause everyone to hear what you want to say to them today. If you agree, just say amen. amen. You may be seated in his presence. How many of you have heard this story and this sermon before? Lift your hands. You know, I'm not going to be embarrassed that you heard what I'm going to preach. You look very familiar. <laughs> um, and I have to pause and digress a little bit. I was born in Trinidad and Tobago, grew up in Trinidad and Tobago. And, oh, the Trini in the house. I looked and I was said, oh my gosh, this is, this is Carol Anderson. Carol Anderson. So I'm so glad to be in the presence of royalty. All of you royal people. Yes. So to continue what we were talking about and what the, the pastors have proposed as the topic for this this month, I want to talk about how to end a marriage. How to end a marriage. Today we're going to look at things that will kill relationship. How many of you are married? How many of you are happily married? Don't put your hand out. Don't put your hand out. No. How many of you are single and want to be married? How many of you are single and okay and, you know? Oh. <laughs> okay, so we, we're, we're speaking today to everyone. Those of you who are married, you'll have some really great information. Those of you wanting to get married, you're in a great place, especially if you're not in love at the moment. It means that you're choosing maybe a little bit better. And those of you who don't want to get married, just stay and support us. Is that all right? Amen. So I like to have an objective for what we're speaking about. And we want to just focus a little bit on the fact, the difference between the male and female. I'm a psychologist and a social scientist. Someone asked if that's a real thing. Um, doing the science of socializing, socialism, um, and my third, this third doctoral degree that I'm completing is in um, leadership. So what we're doing is looking, I'm really curious about the mind and, the, and how we operate. So you're going to get today not just my feeling, I am a theologian, theologian first, that's my first degree in theology, but we're going to go a little deeper. Is that okay? So we're looking at the, the fact that for a man, private and public disrespect is a lethal blow to marriage. Private and public disrespect is a lethal blow to the marriage. We'll also look a little bit on... For the woman, the lack of demonstrated love is a lethal blow to the marriage. Demonstrated love. Because we have the I love you and that's the feeling, but we want to go a little deeper. Are you still with me? All right, so we're not just for the married couples, but for those contemplating marriage, we want you to stay with us. Have your notebooks, have your, your um, because you may want to take some, have some questions that we may take, or you can give those questions to your pastor. So it's very common when we read the book of Esther to focus on her as the main character of the story. But being a student of the text, you look at everyone that has been mentioned. Because what I found in the wisdom of God, if he takes the time to say it, there must be some, something great in the details. Right? The lessons are in the details. The lessons is in the details. So God never wastes information. If he tells it, there's a lesson for it. So let's go back and see what we could glean from the amazing book of Esther. One, the king had a wife that he loved. Can we agree on that? 
The king had a wife that he was proud of. Yeah? Okay. He wasn't afraid of her influence. Do you see that? Mm-hmm. I want that to settle a little bit. Because one of the things that you find in marriages is a power struggle. A power struggle. He shared and allowed her to have a party as big as his. Did you see that? She had a voice that was not stifled. Do you see that? Husbands, do you see that? (laughs) Wives, do you see that? In verse 9 of the book that we just read, the chapter we just read, Queen Vashti also gave a banquet. So we see that the king had a banquet with all his boys. At the same time, his wife has a banquet with all her girls. What that says to me is that he is not threatened by her level of influence. Amen. So we talked before about the male, female, and the fact that God always put men, the man first, except when we looked in Genesis 3, where we see that the woman ended up first when in times of punishment, right? He he punished the serpent, then the woman, then the man. And that order was reversed only because she wanted to lead. So when she leads, she stands the consequences, Mm, that's not me. He just reversed it. You want to be first? Let's be first. But with first, you have to take the consequences of whatever action you want the other person to do, to take. So I don't know why you would want to do that when you can just blame someone else, right? I don't know. So he, he does not feel threatened by her. He gives her the ability to, to, to fulfill her purpose, to have all that she needs to have, and she has the influence. And if he is a wise king, he also knows that she who has influence over the women has influence over the husband. You, you getting? Are we there? You with me? So He sends this request. What does this request mean to Vashti? So she's having her party. He's having her. He's having his. And he says, I want my girl to come over here so that you guys can see her. But what this meant to her is that it was a disruption of her own celebration. She gets the message from her husband and she says, no. You're messing with my party. She would have lost influence if she complied with her husband's request. Can you see that? You're here running this party. Your husband says to come. And you're just like, uh, you know, once my husband says to come, I'm gone. She no longer felt that she should do what she did in the beginning of the relationship in order to keep him. Now she is in the place. All the time she was auditioning for the role. And when she gets the role, and we've seen this over and over again, Over and over again. She felt it was humiliating and inconsiderate for her husband to use her like that. All of her feelings, we can say they were very legitimate. But the way she communicated her displeasure needed some work. She didn't realize that her most powerful tool was her femininity. She faced him with aggression. How dare you call me 
Guess what? I am Vashti the queen. And how many times would your husband or wife call you, you watch their name come up on your phone, on your caller ID, but because you are no longer dating, you got the, you got the, the ring on the fourth, both of them, now we can say, I don't need to, I don't need to respond. But before, yeah, you would run out of a job, run out of an interview, or text real quickly, can't talk now. But right now, she publicly disrespected him, and he was bruised in a way that only a man understands. Just for you, I'll say it again. She bruised him. Vashti did not understand men. The proverb says, the wise woman builds. Now I want to take you back to the place and let you understand the relationship. The relationship did not have a male dominance. There was a level of equality there in that relationship that you do not see a lot of in scripture. So if you saw the dominance, you would understand the response. At least understand, if not agree. You understand. But it's not there. Note that while he could have made an autonomous decision, he conferred with his boys. So he's feeling this and he could have demanded that she come. He did not demand. Do you see that? As king, she could have been dead just right there. But whenever stuff like that happens, the man gets into a place of vulnerability. Because she who is the neck, she who holds his heart, disrespects him and it destabilizes him a bit. So where does he go to his boys? Note the men are unified as to what disrespect is. While most times it literally flies over the woman's head. The man keeps saying, why are you disrespecting me? You are disrespecting me. Disres and you're like, what? Grow up already. What are you talking about? But the man understood. So let's look a little bit at, at, at Vashti. The story in Esther goes like this. The king throws his party and he wants to show off his girl. She doesn't want to come. Vashti refuses and the king feels disrespected and banish her from his presence, citing the magnitude of her response to him. It was not, have you ever been on a train in a supermarket on the street and see a woman talking to her man like it? He is her child. Yeah. In the church, well, mm-hmm, okay. Okay. Because somehow that maternal instinct seemed to feel like I need to, and I'm going to show you someone in the Bible who felt the same way. I'm smarter than him. And although we were on the same level when we were dating, all of a sudden, all his foolishness, <laughs> comes to the top and he can let I can't follow this man he's not a leader and no no one put a gun to your head to cause you to marry this person and all the spiritual discernment and prophetic insight was there as well but now you feel that God is saying that you need to just drop this. 
sometime we'll come back and talk about the fact that you cannot marry the wrong person. Uh huh. You cannot marry, as a child of God, you cannot marry the wrong person. How many of us get into, you, let that settle in there. Where, is, where was your God? So I didn't hear God when I chose this person. Really? Let it settle a little bit. You're, we are minimizing, like we talked about, the irreconcilable differences. If you go into a job, many of us go into jobs with tough supervisors, um, bad hours, all of that, and this job is tough. And we learn. We learn that our supervisor wants coffee early in the morning and we get that coffee. And we learn that they don't want it typed on this paper, on that paper. And we adjust and we adjust and we adjust. Because the bills need to be paid. But when it comes to the relationship, this is the wrong person because you do not want to do the work. Your steps are ordered by God and God does not make mistakes. You need to get the skill and we're going to talk about that if we get the time. The skill. Oh, okay. <laughs> the skill to be able to walk through the nuances of the relationship. Tell me one thing that marriage faces that God cannot heal. One. Now, if he is a Hittite, be a Levite. You can get, get that later on, right? If he is a Hittite, then you be a Levite. Everything else you need to settle and let God work it through you. If you want to get divorced, I'm not telling you not to get divorced, but I'm saying don't say God said. God told me this is the wrong person. Stop it. Because God told you it was the right person when you did it. And when everybody around you was telling you to take some more time, you said, no, I feel God. And now you don't feel anymore so you want us to come in and we, because we're nice and polite, we'll say, uh-huh, uh-huh. But don't come and try to prophesy because we have to know at that point what side you're on. Because if you are vacillating as to whether you hear the voice of God or not, how do we know that this time when you're prophesying to me that you are really hearing from God? If you cause me to question you, do not be mad when I question you. I'm not trying to mess with you. I got a ways to go. I'm not trying to mess with you. So we have to know and know and know that our steps are ordered by God. And even though we're walking through the valley of the shadow, not the death, the shadow of death, we need to fear no evil because God is with me. We cannot be like the world. And I know some of you are mad at me right now because some of you are thinking about it. But I did not call myself here, so just talk to God and, and deal with it. There's some people who see Vashti as a hero and she represents women because she stood up for herself. And note, we're not saying that she should not stand up for herself, but we're talking about the way that it was done. Very few preachers and teachers see that Esther also disobeyed her husband. She disobeyed her husband's command as did Vashti, but in Esther's case, she does it with a display of femininity and humility that wins her king's favor. In other words, whereas Vashti was openly defiant and publicly disrespectful, Esther used humility wrapped in femininity. Her approach was different, and his approach his response was different. Now, when you argue, you have to think about 
Did the argument start with the first comment or did it start with the response? He who has the power to reply has the power to diffuse. <laughs> he who has the power to reply has the power to diffuse. So it doesn't matter what is said. How I reply would determine whether we have an argument or not. So we're fighting about what you said. No. This fight happened because of how you responded. So whenever you fight, we're fighting all the time, we're fighting, it's like a seesaw. If you don't jump on, that person can stay there and desire to be going up and down, back and forth, but it's not going to happen. It needs, your, it needs you to comply, to join in, to be able to get to an argument. So when you say, we argue too much, that's right, but you always have a choice. Amen? Amen. So her, her response, her approach was different, and so his response was different. So what it took to, to replace Vashti, later the king, his fury subsided. He remembered Vashti and what she had done, what he had decreed about her. So he's going back and he's thinking about everything. And the, the, the attendant is seeing the sorrow that this man is going through. If you, when you buy my book, you're going to see that we talk about the fact that men go through pain that women don't understand. In the book, we did research with several men, a lot of men, and um, asked them about after the divorce, what happened. When relationships break up, there are some men who cry for days, don't eat. Doesn't that sound strange for us as women? It sounds like... One man wrote a letter to his ex-wife saying, I wish I did better because I want you in my life. So this is what's going on here. He is... His, his friends around, they're seeing that he is hurting. And he says, let's replace her with another woman. And sometimes we see that and we don't understand that that has nothing to do with love. But because of the way the man is wired, he is wired, he's wired like God. Oh, Y'all going to throw me out now, but let me just, I'm in the water, so let me just stay here. Amen. <laughs> He's like God. God loves worship and adoration. So when you see it in the man, do not, don't, don't, don't talk bad about him or don't make him feel bad. He's built and wired. If you want him to move, his battery is adoration. His battery, his gas is adoration, is respect. And that is where the DNA of God exhibits itself. But you know what we say? You're so needy. Oh my gosh, grow up. Didn't you just call me five minutes ago? Mm. Because we're not recognizing the similarities. And so when he gets down there, what is depleted has to be reestablished. And that is reestablished by another person who is going to come. God, men of God may not start with sexual relationship, but what they will gravitate to is someone who says, you're a good man. You're an amazing man. He comes home and is like, oh God. You again, move your shoes, move your hat. How many times I have to ask you? Oh Ugh. 
I'm not saying anything. But, but, and then he goes to work and someone, someone said that, that tie is nice. That, you know, I can't, I, I don't want to make a decision. And this is not a, a romantic relationship. Here's an example. I have a lot of clients who are pastors. And one pastor said, he was pastor in a particular church, let's say for about 10 years. And his wife would sit in the front, you know, in the first lady seat. And she'll fall asleep every single Sunday. Then, you know, he would ask her on the time that she might be awake, he goes up to the office and he says, how did I preach? You know, she's like, oh my gosh, how many times I have to tell you, you're good, you're good, you're good. Everybody says, you're good, you're good, you're good. And one day he is preaching and he says, I think I I spoke some time ago, let's say uh, from the book of Esther. I don't remember one chapter and someone in the, in the congregation, this woman in the congregation said, after the service, she showed him her, her book, her notebook, and she had every sermon that she, he had ever preached. Every sermon. Every sermon that he had ever preached. Uh-huh. <laughs> and something inside of him just rose up. And being the man of God that he is, he didn't do anything about it. But when on Sunday morning that he would preach, he would look in her direction for her affirmation. Because he knew that in the congregation, if nobody else was listening, he had one person and he began to draw strength from her. Because when she nodded his head, her head, he felt it in his manhood. When she said amen, she felt it. He felt it. But when his wife said, again? So uh, you, you see that it was not that he would go. He never had a romantic relationship or crossed any lines with her. But in the time when he's preparing his message, what, are you gonna th- what do you think is going on in his mind? I wonder if... Sister Sharon would like this. And we don't understand that that is a basic need of man for that affirmation. And the woman who recognizes that and feeds that has his heart. And somebody else may have his ring and his presence. I'm not trying to mess with you. Disrespect from the woman he loves leaves a man vulnerable to mask his pain. He would seek out adoration elsewhere. For the man of God, it does not mean that he would seek romantic relationship, but he needs to be fed. He needs to be affirmed. And the man of God say, Amen. 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 This marriage ended because this couple didn't understand that the language of love for a man is respect and for the woman is love manifested. If Vashti is like most women, she feels, she felt that her husband dishonored her, disrespected her. I'm talking from the woman's perspective. He should be a little bit more sensitive. I'm here doing this, you know. She's feeling like that. And he doesn't understand that. In fact, if you, if you, you can write this down. In Genesis chapter 30. Men sometimes miss the cry of a woman, the need of a woman. Now, for those of you who are single, stop asking God to send you Boaz and send, ask God to send you a Jacob. A Jacob. If you look at the Jacob story, mm, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. For, for Rachel. 
even down to what happened when, when if you, you're a student of the text, you will see with the story with Joseph and that coat. Rachel had two children, Joseph and Benjamin. And remember when Joseph was caught and he was asking to see his brother, his brother Benjamin, the other brother says, we cannot do that. Our father already lost Joseph, whom he loved. He cannot now lose Benjamin. Now he had 12 sons and one daughter, 12 sons, but he loved Rachel. Did you see in the story that even when he was going to meet his brother Esau, you saw what he did? Yeah, he put the, he put the army in front and then after the army came the, the, the maid servants and then after the maid servant, poor Leah, you know, we, yeah, poor Leah. <laughs> even the Bible says she was made like a gazelle. I mean, not even the word was kind to her. She crossed eye and like a gazelle. But in, through the lineage of Jesus Christ, he did not come through Rachel. He came through Leah. But there's a conversation in Genesis chapter 30 between um, Jacob and Rachel. And the other little tidbit I want to give to you is that Rachel, Sarah, and Rebecca, those three coming down that lineage, they all had the same problem in terms of barrenness. And another time we can go through that. So what, the verse says, when Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, she carried, she envied her sister. She said to Jacob, give me children or I die. Jacob, missing the need, begins to get angry and said to her, am I in the place of God? There are sometimes men, I want to say 98% of the time because in the other percent, um, 2 percent is when we're being bratty, but 98% of the time in the argument is a need, unmet need. In that, that thing that she's fussing about and, and talking about over and over is an unmet need. There are times you would hear things like, you don't ever take out the garbage. You know we've been living here so long. The garbage truck comes at the same time all the time. You don't even hug me anymore when we go to bed. And he's like, huh? What are you talking about? But she drops it in there while she thinks she has his attention. And men, look beyond the argument and look for the need, the unmet need. When she says, when she says, um, you say, what's going on? Nothing. You okay? Yes. You have to look at the tone of that yes. Because inside of there, if you leave and walk away when she says yes, she's going to think you're insensitive because you miss the manual that says men should come with the ability to read our minds. So, so in that instance with Jacob, he misses an opportunity. He doesn't see that she's hurting and he attacks her. So there are times that you need to listen. Again, it is all in the, the response. Like, baby, what, what, is it, what is it you want? You know, you have me, I'm loving on you. But do not miss that opportunity. All right, let's real quickly jump to uh, Miss Esther. Esther pleased him, her husband, I was going to say, we don't know if she was married yet, but you are going to throw me out of the church. Um, uh, uh-huh. <laughs> it's, and, and this is something that we, I love, I love, and that's why I like the relaxed 
mode of your church as you, as you read and study the word. Because when I want you all to go look at the story and, and, and come back and tell me. Um, she pleased him and won his favor. Immediately he provided her when <laughs> he provided her with beauty, treatment, and special food. What did I say? Uh Uh-huh. Take me like I am. (laughs) Take me like I am. The preparation for her husband was not just her her spiritual relationship with God that she can speak in tongues and she can deliver and she has been saved for 10 years. The woman had to look good and eat well, right? Right? So that she could look good. Before a young woman turn, her turn come, came to go into the king, she had to complete 12 months of beauty treatment prescribed for the woman. How many months? 12. Six months with oil and myrrh and six with perfume and cosmetics. Look, it's in the Bible. I did not put it in there. You don't have to wear it if you don't want it. But it says it in the book, right? Yeah, the people who says God doesn't, if you don't like it, you don't like it, right? That's okay. But don't make us go to hell because we want to put a little lipstick on our lip. In Jesus' holy mighty name. When the turn came for Esther to go in, she asked for nothing other than what her uncle said that she can have. So she was not greedy. She's not coming. There is some, and let me speak to the single women. There is an anointing to date that's upon women because they want to be fed. They want to go to to nice restaurants. Uh, The the men are qualified. I know I'm stepping right on your corn right now. Just say ouch. There is... I don't know where we got the concept that before a man is your man, that he is responsible for taking care of you financially. I don't know where the book is. I don't know where we saw it. The first date should be Dutch. Or or you tried, I don't know why, but we judge the man by his ability to take us to a restaurant. You are not his girl. I, I like to be treated well, but it got to be treated well by your man. That is why, based on what you eat, I know of people, because I'm also a dating coach where people have their earphone in their ear and I'm talking to them through the date. I get paid to do that. So I know, I know, I know people would go into the restaurant and order the most expensive thing, things they've never eaten or cannot afford themselves, and then judge the man based on his ability to pay. Shame on all of us here who do it and those of y'all looking. Pay your own bill until you get your own man. Pay your own bill until you get your own man. In Jesus' name, amen. We got to break it. Because then when they pay all of that and they want to hold your hand or whatever. No, I'm a mighty woman of God. No, one of the gifts of the Spirit should be temperance. Right? One of them. I need, Lord, let me leave these people alone. So, so I want to I wanna jump down. I want to jump down to another example that's going to mess with y'all. Thank you so much. I have had the opportunities to speak in a lot of women's conferences. I have had an opportunity to speak in a lot of men's conferences. I think I shared with with some of you that I spent the time to learn about the male brain. The the book that I um, the, the first book that I wrote. Between seven, eight hundred men, we interviewed. If you were my friend during that time, and a man, I'm sitting down and I'm asking, so why do men? Yesterday, I'm asking my husband, oh, I can't, should I? I'm, 
I was asking him why men get so, you know, in their feelings and hurt when, um, when their wife cheats on them and, and, and the other way. But there's no, there's some things in the male culture. There's no, it's like you say, cuz. There's no rhyme or reason about it. You know, you can't endorse it. You can't, it is what it is. But I want, in most of the conferences, when people talk about Abigail, they speak about Abigail like she did this wonderful thing. Can I tell you the backstory? Is it okay? Yeah? Tell, tell the backstory. Okay. Let me read it for you. For those of you who have not read your Bible all week, this is going to be reading. <laughs> All right, so now Samuel died and all Israel assembled and mourned for him. And they buried him at his home. Then David moved down into the desert. A certain man in Moan who had property there at Carmel was very wealthy. He had a thousand goats and three thousand sheep which he was sharing. Sharing. His name was Nabal, and his wife's name was Abigail. She was an intelligent and beautiful woman, but her husband was surely the mean, very mean in his dealings. Sometimes the Bible is just not kind to some of the people, right? While David was in the wilderness, he heard that Nabal was there working with his sheep. So he sent 10 young men and said to them, go up to Nabal and greet him in my name. Say to him, long life to you, good health to you and your household and good health to all that is yours. Now I hear that it is sheep sharing time. When your shepherds were with us, we did not mistreat them. And the whole time they were there, nothing of theirs were missing. Ask your own servants and they will tell you, therefore, be favorable towards my men since we come in at a festive time. You're having a, a fun time. Please give your servant and your son David whatever you can find for them. I want you to see that at no time Nabal hired David. David employed himself. Do you see that? David employed, he did not confer with the wealthy man saying, I see this right here and I think I can help. He sends him down and he says, be favorable. I see you're having a party. Now, is it the right of the owner to say no? But when we tell the story, we tell the story as if David is entitled to what Nabal has. Now, there is no, let, let, let me go on, let me go on. When David's men arrived, they gave Nabal the, this message in David's name. Then they waited. Nabal answered David's servant, who on earth is David? I don't know him. I do not know him. Who is this son of Jesse? Many servants are breaking away from their masters these days. Why should I take my bread and water and the meat I have slaughtered for my sharers and give it to men coming from who knows where? Now you're seeing that picture? He's saying, I don't know who you are. You might just run away from your, your, your servant, your master. David then turned around and went back. When they, the servants went back. When they arrived, they reported every word to David. And David gets mad and he straps his sword on. So now we're looking at David as the champion. Not the man who has anger issues. Not the man who... So one of the servants 
told Abigail, Nabal's wife, David sent message from the wilderness to give our master his greeting, but he hurls insults at him. Yet these men were very good to us. Then they did not mistreat us the whole time that we were there. Now think it over and see what you can do because... Disaster is hanging over our master's head and the whole household. He is such a wicked man that no one can talk to him. What we do when we're speaking about this, we say that the, Abigail saved the entire nation and she did. But how thinking about one of the things that you do in hermeneutics is look at the culture of the day. How does this servant feel so comfortable to talk about her husband like that? Now, how does this servant feel comfortable going past the leader of the, the male in the house and going to the woman? What is she doing to attract that kind of allegiance? Are you with me? It's in the book. Abigail acted quickly. She ran to her husband and she told her husband, baby, this is what's going on. No. She took 2,000 loaves of bread and, and all this stuff. Whose stuff was it? Her husband's stuff. She's now making an executive decision. Stay with me. Then she told the servant, go on ahead, I will follow you. But she did not tell her husband, Nabal, dishonor, disrespect. Theologians believe that Abigail knew of David. But let me let the Bible speak for itself because y'all can't blame me. As she came riding her donkey into a mountain, see, she's going to the mountain ravine, there were David and his men descended towards her. And she met him. David had just said, it's been useless watching this, the person's property and all that. And he, he says, he has paid us back with nothing. When Abigail saw David, she quickly got off her donkey and bowed. Respect. She bowed down before David with her face to the ground. She fell at his feet and said, pardon your servant, my Lord, and let me speak to you. Hear what your servant has to say. Please pay no attention, my Lord, to that wicked man, Nabal. Did she say my husband? He is just like his name. His name means fool. And folly goes with him. And as for me, as for me, as for me, your servant, I did not see the men my Lord sent. Because if I had seen them, the, the men, I would have done what he should have done. I did not see the men you sent. And now, my Lord, as surely as the Lord your God lives and you live, since the Lord has kept you from bloodshed and from avenging yourself with your hand, may your enemies, now she's prophesying over him, she's affirming him, may your enemies and all who are intent on harming my Lord be, <laughs> be like Nabal. May all of them be like Nabal. And let this gift which your servant has brought to my Lord be given to the men who follow you. Please forgive your servant's presumption. The Lord your God will certainly make a lasting dynasty for my Lord because you fight the Lord's battle and no wrongdoing will be found in you as long as you live. Even though someone is pursuing you to take your... She was supposed to just give food.
But what she's doing is honoring him and touching his heart. She goes home and she speaks to her husband and he finds out what happened. The man could not take it. He died. And there's so many men who die emotionally, psychologically, when a level of disrespect, you ask your husband to fix the door. It's been 10 long months, the door is not fixed. <laughs> He's, I'm going to get to it, I'm going to get to it. But when you ask the neighbor to do it, all hell. And depending on what it is, if you get a flat tire and he's not the person that you call first, even though you had an argument, it's wrong. And, and what happens, and I'm, 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 I'm going to come and close this out, what happened there is when Nabal dies, David comes for the woman who looked like a wife to him. In his heart and mind, what he is remembering is how she made him feel. So inside of that woman was the ability to do that, but she withheld it from the man who she now says was a fool. When does a woman discover that the man that she's marrying is a fool? When? When he begins to challenge her. When she, ooh, sex in, in marriages doesn't happen because I have a headache. Sex is good for headache because it is, it absolutely is. You know, because you did not move this when I told you to move it. So, so, mm. so there are roommates living at home. But when she, if she gets divorced, and what happens, I, I'm a woman biologically, my birth certificate says it, right? Don't worry, I am for real. But if she is to meet another man, all the sexual desire and everything that she said was dead is going to arise again. It's called that new love. It's the bait that she would use to catch him so she can digress back into that place. So Abigail, the level of disrespect. So when we are talking about her, we have to be able to tell the whole story. Did she do something great? Yes, she did something great, but too what extent? At what cost? Her husband's life. Her husband's life. I'm going to come back sometime if the pastor has me and we're going to talk about the men part of it. So ladies, don't get too, too mad. Don't get too, too mad about it. So, you're not mad? Okay, good, good, good. So when we look at when we look at what happened with Vashti, what's happening, you have to think about these men. They were afraid of the power that Vashti had. They said, if we let this go, every woman in the province will take this example and dishonor and disrespect their husband. They were not concerned as much as, you know, okay, yes, it, he can get another wife, but let's fix this real quick. Because the thing that will topple the marriage, topple the relationship, cause your man to feel three feet high is the dishonor and disrespect. You, and it comes packaged in, in a Coca-Cola bottle. It comes packaged with 10 degrees. Disrespect comes in every form and every size. But Proverbs said the wise woman builds. If you're going to do a good thing, without the, 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 the 
permission of your spouse, it ceases to be that good thing. I'm going to, I, I, I'm here in the deep, I'm going to go. When you say that God has called you, called you to go to Africa, called you, and your husband is being neglected, shame on you. You got to be able to ask yourself if God is going to override the voice of the man that he has put in your life as prophet, priest, and king. Because sometimes we believe that we get so deep in God that we now, we know more. I'm more spiritual. I'm more intellectual. He doesn't fast. But there are times that you need to be able to leave church and church business and take care of home business. Amen. I know y'all are mad, but Jesus is happy. Let, let, let me fix this. All right. I have two minutes. Okay. It's very important for us to recognize that God is, what God is doing in this season, he is not doing it without the wound man. What God is doing in this season, he is not doing it without the wound man. We do not have to fight for the position that God has already given us. And for most of us, our husband has given us too. We are living in a time where women are in the forefront of business, politics, and everything else. When we get home, we need to be able to hand the reins over to the man. To the man, to your man. Is that right? That, oh, that's okay. I'm trying to see what to leave and, 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 and what to. Uh, there is a season for not just good intentions. Do you know what's the sandpaper? The intention of the sandpaper is to smoothen the surface. And the surface is crying. We have to go past that intention. My intention is to please God. The process of that is very important. That you t- see if you are having casualty. When God has called you to fast, it is fasting with permission. The woman's body, I, I hated that verse, but I'm kind of liking it now. Because it doesn't only say the woman's body belonged to the man. The man's body belonged to the woman. And there are women who crave sex from their husband too. And initiate sex. Amen? Amen. Okay. I'm going to have my husband come and stand by me for a little bit. To help me to end this. Marriage, marriages are ending. The, the percentage that we have in the church is higher than the world if we incorporate emotional divorce. Emotional divorce is that place where people live together, they cohabitate, they share bills and everything else, but there's no romantic connection. So if we add that on top of the legal divorce, we have a higher rate. We are, we are getting divorced too quickly, and it's not a good representation of Jesus Christ. And so today, what I wanted to show you was some of the things that add to the divorce rate. And for us as women, it's understanding what respect is to the man. Understanding that. And for the man, understanding the manifestation of that love, where she sounds like she's needy. We say that women are, um, what's that word? Insecure. And anytime you say anything is insecure, it really speaks to about the owner. Because you, the owner needs to secure that, right? And securing may be more frequent texting, you know, have your phone more visible, you know, be more open. That's what she needs. Stand in his presence. 